Mandy Friedman. How are you, Karen Brooks? Welcome to Life in a Garden Online. Are you nervous? You've got that nervous no. look. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. Come on, when are you uh, in front of the screen, behind the screen? Lovely painting yeah, behind you, by not, the way. Yes, I want to say that I've got this amazing friend who paints amazing stuff and gave me a wonderful gift, which is an elephant, which I love, my best, and a khamsa and an evil eye, and you guys should commission her to do some paintings for you. Nice friends candy, you've got. By the way. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about you, Karen. Really? Really? Not great. You are, the, you are the woman of the hour, shall we speak. You are the dough in the putty in my hands. Let's knead you and see what you <laughs> <we> get. <laughs> I'm so funny. No, no, no. Let's stop going there. Who was that? I'm sure that was Michelle. Was that Michelle? No, Michelle's not here. Okay. It was me. Okay. Me? Who's me? Hello, me. Anyway, so, Karen. We are going to talk about, first of all, tell us about yourself. There are people here who don't really know you, like the rest of us do. And thank you for brushing away today. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, um, I'm a TV producer. I'm a single mom. My son is turning 17 in October. And um, I also garden. And one of the things I didn't put on my bio, of course, is that I'm dog mad. Dog man. Um, I am very honoured, dog man, uh, honoured to be an honorary director of Dogtown SA, which is an amazing one of a kind rescue in Henox River. Um, it's what is known as a no kill shelter, and they take dogs who really have reached the end of their line. So if you're looking for a charity to support, it's the most amazing charity. And um, a lot of my TV work is hosting international documentaries and reality shows and travel shows that want to shoot in South Africa. So, as you can imagine, I no longer have a business. Yes, is that why all the lights <laughs> around you are red this evening? Yeah. Did you see that they lit up Northcliffe Tower, Water Tower yesterday? Oh, I didn't. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll try there, and find there a picture. Were a and couple of, yeah, there are a couple of other big places that did... Um, did, uh, that solidarity thing, which is great. Um, so, at, about three weeks into lockdown, I discovered there were no Cadbury's chocolates in the shops. Oh, what a tragedy. And I have, you know, terrible. I can't afford lint and I need chocolate. So, I started baking chocolate biscuits and things just spiraled from there. There's a, there's a big difference between chocolate biscuits and bread. So how did we get from, from batter okay. to dough? Although it's so, cookie dough. Um, the blog that I got most of my biscuit recipes from is something called Baking a Moment. It's a woman named Ali who um, has been doing it for quite a long time. Obviously it's in America. And she had a baguette recipe on her blog, which I tried, and um, I was quite impressed with it. And it mentioned that it was adapted from a book called One Dough Ten Breads by a woman called Sarah Black. And um, my friend Jane was also baking way before I did. She and her husband bake bread often. And she sent me her ciabatta recipe, which involved lifting the dough out of the bowl and turning it over a hundred times. Wow. When I, yeah. yeah, exactly. When I eventually was able to get hold of um, a copy of One Dough Ten Breads, um, it's, it's such a brilliant book because literally there is one dough, you adjust it by the amount of water you put in, and you get ciabatta focaccia or French bread. And then as it goes through the book, she adds whole wheat to make a country bread. She puts the French dough into a tin and you've got a slicing loaf and so on and so forth. 
and it only involves folding. You don't have to knead. It's completely brilliant. The so lazy no cook's way, no need to knead. Okay. And it, like I said to you today, a, a day feels weird now when I don't make bread. So you've actually turned this into a little business now. I'm, I'm trying. It's interesting. It's it's uh, uh, highs and lows. I've had no orders this week at all. And last week, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I did about 12 orders, I think. So, um, I, you know, it's obviously a taste thing and whether people need it or whether you're at the forefront of their mind. But uh, I have to pay you, Mandy. And the what? pockets, yeah. I have to. Uh, Mandy, you are to blame for the Kit Kat experiment, which has, uh, which is the thing that that made this business launch because people started asking for them. Well, congratulations. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> so now we what are. Is, hey, what, 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 what? Uh, what is? Well, yeah, what is the Kit Kat like? I haven't eaten any of it in a long time because I keep selling them. The Kit Kat's delicious, particularly with the raisins oh, in. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. All right. Rather you than me, but okay. No, there's, I love raisins. So Chelsea buns, if I'm going to buy a bread, it's either going to have olives in or raisins in, one of the two. Um, no spinach and cheese and stuff like that for me, but definitely definitely raisins and, and, and olives. There's nothing nicer than a, a, a chewy olive bread with butter and... Danish feta and more olives and a bit of chili Ooh. and some lettuce. Delicious. Yeah. Delicious. Jalapenos. Delicious. Okay, so now let's talk focaccia. Okay. You're going to talk us through how to bake focaccia tonight. In fact, you went the extra mile and made what is Kitka? <laughs> we're, going to ask that, we're going to answer that question in two seconds. You went the extra while and you actually made a series of videos for everybody to watch and we're going to talk talk That's our right. way through them okay karen what is kitka kitka is a jewish a traditional jewish bread it's an enriched bread with eggs and sugar or honey and it's usually plaited and it's usually topped with either poppy or sesame seeds at new year we make round ones to signify the continuity of life and it's delicious. It is delicious. Um, it's a sweet bread. It's a sweet bread and it's plattered. It's absolutely divine. Um, and you can eat a whole loaf if you're not very careful. Yeah. <laughs> and you pull it apart. You don't, sure. usually cut, you don't usually cut Kitka. You pull it. No. That's, the, that's the Kitka. So Karen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to screen share in my usual fashion. Let's um, see what happens. Let's see what happens. Oh, hang on. We opened it in the wrong thing. No, yeah. it's right. No, no, no. We opened it. Oh, I, you've I got the sound in. on. Yeah, it's got sound on. So okay. let me see. I knew I was going to cock up something. Right. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I don't know why you give me so much responsibility. I could have done it. I'm sorry. I can actually still if you like. No, no, no. I've got this taped now. There we go. What are we doing? Okay, so this is the equipment. I'm showing you my dough scraper. I'll talk about that just now. Uh, a tray, a lid or cling film, a little sieve. Um, or a shaker. I use the shaker for my bread dough and the sieve for my cake flour. Um, a sieve, I'll talk about that later as well. Nobody uses them anymore. A bowl, very important, a digital scale. This is from Discam, it's under 200 Rand. A very worthwhile investment. I've got one, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Uh, white bread flour, which we'll talk about. Yeast, table salt, uh, sugar, I use brown, but you can use anything. Olive oil or normal oil. Um, and then we've got coarse salt that I grind, that's to put on top. 
and herbs. That's uh, frozen rosemary in oil or dried uh, dried herbs. You can use any kind you like. Um, Jamie Oliver's mentor Gennaro does a very nice focaccia with a fresh basil leaf and a half a cherry tomato, and he pushes those and it makes a little a little base for the cherry tomato with the basil and pushes that into his focaccia. Um, and Sarah Black, whose book I, I use, um, does it with lemon and orange slices with the peels on. So first of all, what we do is uh, 50 grams of warm water, a pinch of sugar, and um, our yeast, which is one and a half teaspoons. Now, in South Africa, we really only get instant yeast. If you look at American recipes, you might see something called active dry yeast. In theory, you should use a little bit less of our yeast than that, but I actually don't. Um, I, I use those quantities. Um, I can talk about yeast when, when we stop uh, the video. Now, I'm just pouring the yeast into the water and leaving it to soak up the water for a few minutes. They call that blooming, which you don't really need to do with instant yeast, but I do it because I got into the habit when I started, my doughs weren't rising, and uh, a professional baker gave me that suggestion, among others. And then um, I weigh and serve 450 grams of bread flour. Um, Very precise. Is it, necessary? Is it yes. necessary to be so precise? Listen, the thing is that the yeast is a, a, the yeast creates a chemical reaction. So if you don't follow weights and measures, you probably won't get the results you're looking for. Um, so, I, you know, I'm in the habit of, of uh, weighing and measuring, and I do that. Um, in small quantities, you can use teaspoon measures, but water um, and flour, I always weigh. Okay. And by the way, a, a water weight, a gram of water is the same as a milliliter of water. You learned that at school, saying, right? Yes, if I'm saying 500 grams of water, you can also do 500 milliliters. Um, and then I am putting in the two teaspoons of salt. You cannot bake bread without salt. If you've got issues with salt, you need to find something else to eat. Two tablespoons of sugar. I like my butter you, salted. Yes. You can you can use less sugar if you or none at all if you like. Uh, sorry, I went the wrong way around. There's the salt, and and actually in our household we find that the recipes have too little salt, so I usually increase it. Um, and um, I, I mix with my hands, <laughs> but in the in but the a nice little video, motion going there, huh? Yeah. So you, uh, you stiffen your index and middle finger and mix with that and always keep your other hand um, clean. You could no. also use the, the back of a wooden spoon, which works quite nicely. Is that the yeast mixture? It looks very dodgy. It, it is a weird color and a weird texture, but um, it's not as weird as sourdough, which makes glue if you don't wash your utensils up immediately. So it, it makes like a kind of beer smelling kind of paste. Um, and at this point it would have been dissolved. And if I'd left it for a few more minutes, you would have seen it starting to, to make tiny, tiny bubbles on top. So what you do now is you pour the yeast into the flour and mix it slightly. And then you weigh your main amount of water, which is uh two i always keep getting this wrong 260 grams of water now here i've reduced the amount of water in this recipe i think that south african flour is less absorbent than american flour so I, you know i've been experimenting now for three months and this i reduce the water by 60 grams in every recipe i do is flour not flour so Bread flour has a higher protein content than cake flour. And that protein creates something called gluten, which gives the structure to your bread. 
Gluten holds the air bubbles that the yeast creates, which allows you to make bread that rises and is fluffy and has holes in it. You can do these recipes with cake flour. When I started, I was using cake flour because I couldn't get bread flour. Yeah, there was a um, shortage of bread flour. Day, I there was a big shortage. And, and uh, so now, I mean, I've got about four bags in my cupboard. I don't, I don't risk getting into a situation where I don't have any bread flour. But as a matter of interest, kick is made with cake flour. Clearly, you don't mind getting your hands dirty. Not at all, but you'll see how I clean them at the end because you, your instinct might be to rub your hands together over the bowl and you definitely mustn't do that. So two tablespoons of, here I've used olive oil, you can use uh, sunflower oil. Um, I, was, I was feeling rich. Uh, be careful, don't put olive oil onto the dry ingredients, you must add it into the water, otherwise it makes funny little lumps of oil in your dough. Now, what, what you do here is you mix it to what the professionals all call a shaggy dough. In other words, you don't over mix it till it's smooth and beautiful. You just mix it until all the flour has been moistened by the water, uh, which here yeah, took, I don't know, three, four minutes. It's, it's not a long process. Um, a lot of the YouTube chefs I, I watch don't clean the sides of their bowls. I'm a Virgo, so I, I can't deal with that. <laughs> so you, you'll see that um, once it is all mixed up, I'm going to take my homemade dough scraper, which is a table mat that I cut into a shape I saw on a video. You can buy these. There's a little set at Westpac that's got three different scrapers in, one like this, one that's straight and one that's metal. Um, and here you can see, I'm wiping the dough off my hands. You, you really should not rub your hands over your dough. You will regret it. Those little well, worms will happen. Will, Lumpy. They, they, it makes, yeah, it makes little worms and you'll never get rid of them in your dough. They'll be horrible lumps. Interesting. So there's the shaggy dough. And what I'm going to do now is cover it. Um, and leave it for 30 minutes. The, the official word for that is called auto lease. Basically, you're leaving it for 30 minutes so that the dough can absorb all the moisture. And yeah, we can talk about the conflicting opinions about what you cover a dough with. What are the conflicting do opinions? Cling, yeah. Do you use cling film? Do you oil the cling film? Do you use uh, a cloth? Do you dampen the cloth or keep it dry? Um, do you use a shower cap? Oh, and honestly, I like I've tried, yeah, chow cap's cute. I've tried all of them and it doesn't really make a difference. I think if you're in a very hot, dry area, then it may be worthwhile considering putting a damp towel on top. And also, not at this stage, but at the next rising, to actually um, oil your bowl flip the dough over, flip it back so that both the underneath and the top of the dough are oiled so that they don't form a crust. But really that's only if it's, it's a very hot environment. These plastic bowls, I find they don't stick. Um, I've got a stainless steel bowl which does stick, so then I oil that. And you're carrying on, we've, uh, we've done 30 minutes, the dough is auto leased. Oh, I thought you said and 13. Just, Sorry, 30. Yeah, okay. 30, half an hour. Okay. Um, and also it doesn't actually matter if you leave it for a little bit longer than that. Um, and, the, and the design I, that you make in the flour, is that very important? Not really. I don't want too much flour being added to my dough at this point. So I spread it as thin as I can. Has it risen um, a lot? No, not at this point. It will have a few bubbles, which I will push out gently. Um, at this point, you tip the dough onto your surface, and honestly, it should be wood, but you know, beggars can't be choosers. I've got granite, it works, it's, it's fine, doesn't matter. So, um, I've hang on, stop. So, does wood, wood make a difference? Um, yes, because it'll keep your dough at a warmer temperature. Ah, so, I mean, it okay. doesn't I, it, bear in mind, I've now learned to make bread in the dead of Johannesburg winter. 
with no central heating, I've had to accommodate for that. Um, so a, a lot of the time I leave stuff, uh, I leave my dough to rise for longer, or I put it near a heater, or in a moment I'll give you a trick about making a homemade proofing box. Okay. So at this stage, I let the dough uh, uh, spread out to its natural shape, and I'm patting it out into a rectangle, turning one short side in uh, about halfway and the other short side over that, and then flipping uh, another turn from the bottom to the halfway to the top and from the top halfway to the bottom. So, so you're, you're nice making little parcels. Parcel, yes, exactly. Now, it's I made a mistake here. I should have flipped the dough over and I didn't. Oh. I just, um, <laughs> yeah. I just uh, make sure that it's got some flour underneath it and leave it to rest for two minutes because that gluten, I've just stretched it now. I want to stretch it again. I want to form the, the gluten strands properly. But it won't it it won't do it immediately a second time. So you just leave it to rest. The recipe says two minutes. I usually leave it for ten. So now, uh, and also you could put oil cling film over it. My bowl is big, so I just flipped it over on top. So now in that two minutes, it's relaxed, and I'm pushing it out again into a rectangle. Um, and now you'll see. It, the dough at this point has started feeling a lot smoother. And because of that, that flour is sticking to it. And as I fold, I'm gonna brush that flour off. I usually use a paintbrush. Um, I just didn't have it with me here, but I brush the extra flour off. You, you don't want to be incorporating more flour into your dough at this point, because then it'll become tough. Um, I use my little scraper to make sure it doesn't stick to the table. At this point, I could have done no flour at all and it would still have been fine. And here, yeah. I'm not pushing out, I'm pushing down to make it stretchy. If you push out, it's just going to bounce right back. So another little parcel, left, right, top, bottom. Sorry, that's Yogi. I know. He's jealous. What's happened there? Are we going um, or not? Tando left the room. <laughs> <laughs> Tando has left the building. So okay, so you're folding so it this, again. I'm folding it a second time. Now with ciabatta, we do it four times. We do it twice and then rest it for 30 minutes and then do it again. Because it's such a, a wet dough, um, it needs the help. So I've got my little parcel. I'm flipping it over. Now, at this point, if you're worried about your dough sticking, you'll pour a little bit of oil into your bowl, put, put the dough in upside down, flip it over so that the top is oiled and cover it up. So now I'm going to show you how to make a proofing box. You take your oven, you turn it on to any temperature for one minute, boil a kettle of water, put a, a cooking pot with that boiling water directly onto the bottom of your oven to create steam. And there you go. You put your pot in, uh, your dough in the oven. And that's a proofing box that will speed up the rising process. So this is the second rest. This is what they call fermentation, where you do, you'll see a recipe that says, wait till it doubles in size. Who knows what doubles in size is? You can test your dough. You want it to have gotten puffy and to spring back when you push it and to be a bit wobbly. Um, I never look at double, double in size. You know, like um, the inside of your thigh. I know, Karen. You can't talk about yes. the inside. No, you can't talk about the inside of the thighs if one is making bread to eat. I mean, really? It's that feeling, man. <laughs> or, the, or your bingo wings. Your bingo wings. There we go. Oh, lovely. This is just getting better. This reminds me of last night's conversation. Oh, sorry. I wasn't there. <laughs> okay, so now um, my job. 
been in my makeshift proofing box for it was probably an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes. And you can see it's it's rounded at the top. Um, it springs back when I poke it a little bit. And it looks a bit tacky. It's obviously, it's tacky. It's obviously grown. Yeah, this dough will always be tacky. It will never be completely um, stick free. So now here's the beauty of a focaccia. You don't have to shape it. Shaping is the hardest thing to learn when you're making bread. So I've just got a roasting pan. You can see it's got high sides. Um, it's uh, it's uh, something like uh, 30 wide by About 37 across. Yeah, it, no, not that big. You can use a cookie sheet, but I, I think a cookie sheet, sheet, you might risk it going over the edges. So it's better to use a roasting pan here. Or, you know, I've got a square Pyrex that I've tried it in before. And um, Sarah Black, my guru, does it in a round uh, a pizza plate that, that is, you know, a metal pizza plate that goes in the oven. So now you gently are pushing down here, not outwards to stretch it. If you push outwards, it's going to spring right back. Looks and you like don't. Fun. It is fun. Of course, it's fun. It's like playing with play doh. Um, it, your aim here is you, it doesn't matter that it's getting holes in it. You want it to have holes because when it bakes, those holes, which will be filled with olive oil, are, are rippling olive oil through the entire dough. Do you know why, when we go into an Italian restaurant, they serve a focaccia that's a pizza base? It's, it's more like a pizza. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure it's the American influence. This focaccia that I'm making is at least going to be four or five centimeters deep, and that's a proper focaccia. Those are, that, that, they should be calling that pizza bianchi. A pizza bianchi is what you do, just with white cheese. With white cheese. Yeah. So there's another kind, you know, with, without uh, cheese, basically. And speaking of those, you know, I do like putting garlic on mine. I didn't yeah. do it on this one. I know, you don't like garlic. Um, because um, this was an order for a client. Um, so That's a lot of oil, Karen. Wow. It's two tablespoons, Mandy. It's okay, not Karen, that much. It looks like a lot of oil, Karen. Wow. And then when you cut into it, it's, it's not there. It's sunk in and it's made it crispy and delicious. So yes, it needs to pool on top and in those dimples that you've made. And in wow, fact- I'm just seeing clogged arteries at the moment, sorry. No, it's olive oil, no clogged arteries. It's a good oil. So you, you chose and olive it, oil here, you didn't go with the sunflower. What are you, oh, is oh no, no, yeah. yeah. The, the uh, focaccia is with olive oil. The sunflower to put inside the dough is fine. That just helps. The reason I put oil in, in my doughs, even when they, 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 it isn't in the recipe, is to give it a little bit more longevity, a little bit more shelf life, because homemade bread has 24 hours, if you're lucky. So now I'm leaving that to rise. We call it proof for 45 minutes and that really depends on your environment. Uh, my kitchen is cold. Um, I probably zap that into my bedroom where there was a heater. Um, if it's during the day, I might put it next to a, a sunny window with a curtain closed. Um, and again, here, yeah, they say doubled in size, meh. Um, that, that will, always get you into trouble. You just want to see that it, when you poke it, it bounces halfway back, then it's ready to bake. Um, and you'll see I do that test here. Um, about, depending on your oven, about 20 minutes left on that rising, I turn my oven on. My oven is dreadful. It runs 30 degrees above temperature, but I only discovered that recently. Um, so I that before or after I, I got burnt bread? <laughs> after, uh, before, before, before. Um, 
the the thing is that I've gotten into the habit. I drop the, the temperature from the recipe by 10 degrees. Um, I should be dropping it by 30. So this recipe, it's very high. It's 240, um, I think. We'll have to that's, look. that's incredibly we'll have high to because you do, you do pastry. It's very great. high. Yeah, it's very high. Um, but there's a reason for that because you want you want um, the bubbles inside the bread to expand very, very quickly. I'm just checking that temperature quickly. Um. Okay, so time is up. Okay, so is that 45 time minutes? is up. Yes, and by the way, I don't use the proofing box method for the second rise. You don't want to apply heat to the dough at that point. Um, you also want to give it time because that develops flavor. So now you can see it's puffed up a lot. Um, and I'm doing the poke test there, which is a gentle poke, and the whole will bounce back part of the way. Oh, look at the bubbles. Yes, exactly. Now you can see that the olive oil is in the middle of that, and when it bakes, it's going to be in the middle of the bread. Yeah, this recipe. This recipe is. Um, oh God, she's putting more oil on. More oil, yes. So the the baking temperature for this, if you've got a normal oven, is two thirty. So I would have done mine on two twenty. Now I'm gently poking some more little dimples into it. Are your hands nicely and, moisturized? Oh. Uh, yeah, Mandy, I wash my hands after every time I've touched the dough and before every time I've touched the dough. No, but I'm talking you about all oil, about olive oil. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. So what's that? Rosemary. That's rosemary that I've kept in the freezer and a la Mr. Jamie Oliver, put it in a little bit of oil and scrunch it up with your hands to release the aromatics. Otherwise, it'll just be toasted leaves. Um, and at this point, you can actually go mad. You can put anything you like. Now, I would, if it was for me, I put a few little slices of garlic, uh, not minced. I slice it and shove it in. Uh, we've tried it with mushrooms. My child didn't like it. Um, for you, I would put olives, of course. Of course. Um, as I said, Sarah Black does one with sliced lemons and oranges, um, uh, uh, skin and all. Um, and, and, you know, they bake and caramelize. She also does one uh, with, with pomegranates. That sounds um, good. Which, so that's, yeah, the, that's the Himalayan rock salt then. That's Himalayan rock salt. You can also use koshering salt, but you must grind it first. The big flakes of koshering salt would be too much. Um, so I've ground that from my grinder. That grinder is from uh, Discam, if anyone's interested. Uh, in getting one of those. Um, Your kitchen is so neat and tidy. You should come see me. Uh, uh, uh. I have become a cleaner a la excellence. Oh, well, you can I come to my kitchen if you want, because this place is chaos. Let me just give you a... Oh, I I'll show you later. I have not had a helper in this house since before lockdown, because my helper is 67 and she has type 1 diabetes. So she has been instructed to stay home. Okay, so now here's a big thing about baking bread, making nice crust. I'm gonna put it in the oven. I do bake in the middle. Some people bake one down from there. Um, but before you put it in, you need to boil a kettle of water. And you will see that I have- You've gone very quiet. Oh, gosh. I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You just went a bit quiet. Oh, okay. Um, I have a roasting tray directly on the bottom of my oven that's been in there since I preheated the oven. So it's hot. I've put my focaccia in, and now I'm going to pour boiling water onto that roasting tray to create steam in the oven, which does two things. It prevents the crust from setting too quickly. And it allows the bread to rise. And then when the crust does set, it becomes very crispy because of that moisture. 
And um, that's, that's almost an oxymoron that the moisture in yeah, the know, makes the bread crust up. Because, because as it evaporates, it makes that crust crispy. Now, I, because I've got such a crappy oven, I always turn my, my breads, regardless of what breads they are. I also spray it again after a minute. That's a spray bottle with water in it. For a minute, I thought it was a spray bottle with a hand sanitizer. <laughs> that would not be fun. So, um, 15 minutes, and then I take it and turn it around because no oven is completely even. Um, that's why people bake bread on baking stones, which I've asked you to make one for me, remember? In mm, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can buy You can buy baking stones on Yappy Chef or Take A Lot. They're different kinds. Some are metal. Um, most of them are absorbent ceramic, which you must never wash. And uh, that gives a very even heat for baking bread. So it's 15 minutes. I've turned it. I put it on for another probably 10. And then I check it. Oh, that's looking and yummy. Yes, but that's I decided it could, could be a little bit darker. Yeah, it doesn't look uh, dark enough. No, no, this is where I'm turning it. Sorry, I'm turning it first. And then I give it another 10 minutes. What about an egg wash or something like that? No, not on these breads. I egg wash Kitka. Uh, these breads don't need egg wash. You don't want that smooth kind of shiny appearance. Your chia butter gets a, gets a decoration of flour um, and your butter gets a pretty score cutting into it. And they don't need an egg wash, definitely not. <clears throat> So now we've got 10 minutes, uh, another 10 minutes. I just checked it. I felt it could be a bit darker. So I left it in. What would you do without that phone, with that clock? Oh, I know. I, I recently discovered there's a timer on my oven. There you go. That looks delicious. I never knew that. That's a big, big, big piece of bread there. That is a big piece of bread. I mean, you could, because it's quite thick, you could cut it probably into 12 Two. or 16 pieces. Yeah, that's a beautiful looking piece. <laughs> a nice smile. <laughs> because I wasn't expecting him to, um, to point the camera at me at that point. My, as I said, my son um, shot this. Very oh, he, is he a cameraman in the making, Kara? Uh, I don't know if he's that interested. Yes, Audrey, you're absolutely right. That does look amazing. Okay, what was next? Hang on, there was another little video here. I just lost my plot, as usual. Yes, I show it coming out. And I have to confess, it didn't come out very well the first time. I had to stop the video and start <laughs> again. And you do you remember twice? you... No, I, I just, yeah, that the end. Do you remember you said, gosh, that's a lot of olive oil? Yes. At the end of the day, actually, there wasn't, I had not greased the pan enough to let it come out um, easily. And one of the, one of the things, um, one of the tips I picked up is if that happens, you should actually put your bread back in the oven for a few minutes, even if it's off, because like a cake, it will start pulling away from the sides eventually. That looks absolutely divine. And I can almost smell the rosemary from here. Yeah, it was, it was a very nice one, that. Very nice. I was pleased with it. That was for my, my, the, the woman who lives in my cottage. So she got it straight away and had it for dinner and she loved it. Audrey says she's going to make her first focaccia this weekend. <laughs> Okay, well, Mandy, Mandy must WhatsApp you my handwritten recipe, but I realized I didn't put the method there. So if, if you want to refresh off the method, I'll type something up for you. Um, yeah, I think the, the method would be great to have, you know, just uh, as, a, as an extra. I will share the recipe on the group just now. Karen, do you get, a, obviously you do, but I'm going to ask it anyway, a lot of satisfaction from baking. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what it is, is um, 
you know, within within the space of three or four hours, you can produce something that's delicious and simple. If you if you break it down to its absolute minimum, if you make sourdough, you are using flour, water, and salt. And and look at the amazing things you get out. Glue. Um, you get glue. You get glue. And if you do it properly, you get bread. I want to show you something. Can I go away for a sec? Just a sec. Don't leave us hanging. Just a sec. So doesn't that bread look delicious, everybody? I, uh... This is the sourdough I'm busy with right now. I love sourdough. Have I told you how much I love sourdough? I'm not sure if you heard that because I didn't have my headphones. That's the sourdough I'm busy with right now. I started it at... Actually, I've, I fed the yeast this morning very early, I, I, very early, about half past four in the morning because I had a commercial shooting in my house today. What does um, I fed the that, yeast mean? I've, I fed the, the starter, sorry. You have to, to wake your starter up when you're making sourdough. Like, Good morning! You give it flour and water, yes. And then you wait for it to bubble and then you mix the dough and this has to sit and I have to fold it every 30 minutes five times. Then I have to leave it to rise for six or seven hours. But doesn't Only a, then can you shape. Doesn't a sourdough starter go from one bread to the next bread? You don't use it all yeah. the... Yeah, but you, you add to it. So I've taken out almost all my starter from my little jug today to make that. And what I did is I put another 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. I let it rise and then I put it in the fridge so that it's... It hasn't died. It, it will go to sleep now, and next time I want it, I'll feed it up again. But you didn't add more yeast. How come you don't have to add more yeast? No, no, no. There's no the the sourdough starter uh, create. It has its own yeast, which it finds from the outside of whichever flour you're using. I it's have like a bacteria. The best success. It's both bacteria and yeast in the flour. I my sourdough starter is made with rye flour. I had the best results from that. Remember our normal run of the mill over the counter, uh, that snowflake uh, bread flour is bleached. So it probably doesn't have natural yeast in it. But the rye that I buy is stone ground. It's not organic, but it worked. Is that Eureka and Mill? Also, yes. <clears throat> That's right. But I would have bought the other one if the other one was available. There's a, there are two stone ground places. Sorry, Mandy, I'm going to cough. That's nice. Uh, love sourdough. How long does it take you to make one sourdough bread? Okay, so um, I fed my starter last night and left it out on the counter. I mixed up what's known as a poolish, which is a pre-ferment this morning at half past four. Um, and I waited for that to bubble. I probably mixed more flour and water and salt into that dough at about uh, three, half past three. Um, and um, I let it auto lease, so absorb the water. And now I'm actually missing a fold. I should have done one at top of seven. So I do. I I, I just I, I'm a bit confused about the whole sourdough thing. I was under the impression Very this is yeast, fermented yeast that it's soured. Because no. the bread is supposed what? to taste slightly sour. Okay, so it's a natural yeast. You, you, the the yeast you buy in the little golden, uh, the little foil packets, that was only invented in the early part of the 20th century. Before that, everyone made their own yeast. So what sourdough is, is uh, natural bacteria and yeast that that have been created from the atmosphere and from the flour. So now if you give me a minute, I'm gonna get my starter and show it to you. She's running away oh, from us again. Denise, I said you're running away from us again. Yes, yes. 
Denise, you're very lucky. What did you, what are you going to do with that sourdough starter that you got? I'm actually going to try and make a sourdough bread. I actually tasted some today. It was absolutely amazing. So that's the starter that you got. The yeah, I got a starter which Karen's going to show you now. That's fantastic. So I Karen, I started this on the 6th of June. Oh, okay. Six days. Yeah, about that. So it took us six days for us to make the starter. So, okay, so walk us through that starter process. I'm, I'm fascinated. Here's my starter. So what you do is you take 50 or 100 grams of flour and 50 or 100 grams of bottled water or tap water that you've allowed to stand so the chlorine can evaporate. And you literally make a little sticky thing like that. You, you don't boil open. the water? No, no, you, no. Boiling water doesn't take the chlorine out of it. Okay. It only comes out if you, if you let it stand. So, and then you do that, you cover it up, put it on the side in your kitchen, not in the fridge, not in the warmth. And you do that every day, 24, after 24 hours. And after about six days, you'll start getting, I don't know if you can see, the bubbles, yeah. Not really, but we'll take your word for it. You'll, you'll start getting bubbles there, and then it goes through various stages. Sometimes it smells a bit like beer. Sometimes, today, it smells like acetone. Oh, that's just charming. A, you know, a byproduct of, of the yeast feeding on the flour is alcohol. So, and um, after about, <clears throat> Two months of trial and error, you might be lucky and come up with a, a loaf like that, which is the loaf that I am the most happiest with that I've ever made. That's gorgeous. I mean, that's a beautiful looking loaf of bread or round of it bread. It is. And that's for Lynn. To answer Audrey's question, do you add 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water every day or only when you need it? So actually, you know, the recipe that everybody does something different. Um, the, the, the big shots always throw stuff away. I, I never did that. I followed the instructions of a guy called uh, Jack. He's got a, a YouTube channel called Bake with Jack. And he did 25 grams of flour and 25 grams of water every day for a week. And that is sufficient that you don't need to throw it away. Um, you need to get a, a fairly large jar or you can see I don't know how many of you still have these Tupperware jugs. I saw another guru of mine, John Kirkwood, keeps his in there, and I started keeping mine there. And that is brilliant. And it never fills up. Um, how long can you keep it for? I mean, and how much do you use? Forever. You can keep it forever. It depends on the recipe you use. Now, I'm using John Kirkwood's recipe, which has, he starts with 50 grams of starter, 200 grams of flour and 200 grams of water for his poolish, which is a pre-ferment. And I had a lot of starter, so I put in 150 grams of starter and I reduced the flour and water. It just something to get it going to start it bubbling up, which it had done by one or two o'clock today. So it depends on the recipe you're following really. So you make it, so you make it, okay, so Helga said six days for us to make the starter. What the happened? Starter, that for, for it to be ready for you to use. And from that point on, as long as you feed it once a week at least, it will keep giving you for the rest of your life. And now you know how God created the earth. Because on the seventh day, he rested. There we go. And then I, you know, the sourdough journey has been an interesting one. I, now what I do, I use one YouTuber's recipe and another YouTuber's method because they all uh, have different things. Yeah, they all they all say different things. The the YouTuber's recipe that I use doesn't even he doesn't even wait. He allows his sourdough to rise the same amount of time as he does his yeast it does. The other guys are saying you need it to grow, to ferment uh, for six to eight hours. And, and again, that's a touch thing. When it's jiggling, it's ready. So if I, 
if I go back to this, which needs my attention now, this has been folded twice. It's going to be folded. I'll show you how you do it. You so now it you put it in the oven. Is this the one where you put it in the no, oven? No, no, the water? I don't. No, I don't put sourdough in the oven. Oh, okay. Ever. You fold it to develop the gluten in the same way that I was making my envelopes with the focaccia, but much more gently because you never punch down a sourdough. And I do this five times over the course of two and a half hours. And once that's done, I do something called the window pan test to see if the gluten's developed. And then there's still a fermentation period that's six or eight hours for so sourdough ready, because it's ready. slow. Bread making is for people who have nothing better to do. Is that what I understand here? Uh, not yeast it does. Not yeast it does. But the sourdough requires a shitload of patience. Excuse my language. <laughs> but one of, one, of, one of the other people that I follow, um, who's actually whose method I follow, this uh, uh, stretch and fold thing, um, has made uh, schedules. For different people like if you work nine to five you can do this before you go to work and that after you come home and and so he's done something very clever there or he's 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 got five different schedules if you're a weekend baker if you're a night owl if you're a pro and you get up at four o'clock in the morning to do your bread and so on i can tell you right now that i'm not getting up at six o'clock in the morning to beat the bread down what's his name Listen, I um, okay, I've got a number of gurus. My, my um, tried and tested English old school chef is a man named John Kirkwood on YouTube. Um, the American guy whose method I follow is called Mike Greenfield. Can you send me um, that list, Karen? I have. I did just before this. Um, okay. The, just before we started. So what are you saying? That I haven't um, checked my WhatsApp? Maybe not. And uh -huh. I sent you, I sent you my go-to site for the biscuits, the one that started it all. Okay, that's fantastic. And even where you can find my Kitka recipe. Oh, giving away trade secrets. Yeah, which is actually, uh, you know, the Hebrew name is Kala, so the Americans call it Kala. It's only in South Africa that we call it Kitka. When you were kneading the dough and mixing the dough with your little finger helicopter goodie, McAfter, um your tattoo what's what's that all about yeah that one um so i i'm not sure if you can see i have a semicolon tattoo which is a, a universal symbol for supportive survivors of suicide and family family of people who have elected to take their own lives um it's a it's an american um movement called project semicolon and I put an infinity around it. Uh, the reason it uses a semicolon is because in grammar, it represents a pause as opposed to a stop. And um, it's just to raise awareness of mental health issues. Um, and it's for me to remember my mother who took her own life just under 24 years ago. So what are you saying? Um, I should put one on my wrist for my brother. It, uh, I never, I, first time I ever had a tattoo, I was 53 when I got it. Um, and it's very meaningful for me. And uh, the sad thing about Project Semicolon um, is uh, um, that organization helped so many people. It was started by a woman called Amy, whose father had committed suicide. And very sadly, about 18 months ago, she also succumbed. Um, depression is an insidious illness and it, 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 with my mother we didn't even know she was that sick. It was a huge shock. Um, she wasn't even really getting treatment and um, so I'm a, an advocate of anything you can do to help someone with depression you should do your best and I'm on medication and I know I will be for the rest of my life. And I, I don't regard it as something shameful. It's brain chemicals. Okay, that was a very sobering kind of end. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
So, like I said, what are you, what, what are you, um, what are you baking now? Is that so? Is that sourdough? And you're going to do what with it? So this, this sourdough is um, going to be folded a couple more times tonight. And then it needs to go into its bulk fermentation. And because it's nighttime, I'll probably do that in the fridge. And then tomorrow it will be wobbly. And Com hang on, I complete, also complete, no, stop. Complete opposite. You're putting the thing to ferment in the fridge as opposed to in the to heat. To slow it down. I don't want it to over ferment. And, and let's say the eight hours between... 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning when I get up, I would have killed it by then. It will over ferment, the dough will, the gluten will, will give up. So, Could you not bake it at that point? No, it still needs, it still needs a rise, it needs shaping and that shape, shape dough needs to sit probably for, most people did overnight, I, I wait two, three hours. So sourdough can be a, like from last night, to tomorrow morning or even tomorrow night and then i've also just started the sponge for your kitka for tomorrow so there's a pre-ferment on the kitka that needs to sit for 45 minutes and then i mix the dough and that dough does get kneaded and then i put it in the fridge and i shape and rise those doughs in the morning and it should be ready for you by about one o'clock that's fantastic Mm -hmm. Don't forget lots I hope you of raisins. <laughs> no, I won't. It is a lot of hard work, and and Adri, there isn't really any money in it. It's nobody's going to get rich making bread. If I had an oven that would take twenty loaves at a time, maybe I could make some money and an industrial mixer. But I, that's not really why I do it. Um, I enjoy the working with my hands. Uh, for quite a few weeks during lockdown, it was the reason I got up in the mornings. So it, it's it therapeutic. Me. Yeah, exactly. Audrey, before before I let everybody go, can you show us your mushrooms? Audrey bought mushrooms from Mush. I, I actually uh. bought them and I ate them. <laughs> <laughs> They finished so, growing already. I mean, because when you sent me that uh, picture, there were only two mushrooms. No, I, I actually, I'll, I'll post you another one. I've actually got two mushrooms. So um, I'm actually, I opened my mushrooms on the other side. So um, I'm waiting for them to come out. And I've ordered new boxes, the shiitake ones. I'm waiting for Andrew to, to have in stock so I can, can go and collect. I was about to ask if but you I'm, had stock. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed this. Um, I was on, on holiday with friends in Mozambique and for a whole two weeks I baked bread every day for my friends and I, I really love the experience and I can't wait, wait, wait to do a focaccia. So this weekend you'll get my picture, Mandy. Fantastic. I love it. Awesome. She and my husband, I assume by she, she meant Karen. She and my husband spent lockdown competing for the best bread of the day. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, if, if I blame Mandy for Kitka, I blame Jane for bread from the outset because it was it was she and I who started talking about it. And my first bread was a silly Jamie Oliver soda bread, which was, we were so impressed with it. I, when I think back to that time, wow. Well, well I, I done. Always, you know, I always say, um, we always say we, we should not eat carbs. But I do. But if I eat bread, I eat good bread. Uh, a nice shabbato, a nice sourdough or something really, really. So if you bake it yourself, it's so much better as the stuff you buy in the shops. Agreed. Yeah, that's true. That's why I'm getting my bread from Karen these days. <laughs> you are so lucky. But I heard you somewhere close to Henops River or somewhere where you've got... Oh, no, no. Uh, Dogtown is, is in Henops River, the charity I support. I live in Joburg. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you want to buy bread instead of... Uh, I'll share your details on the group in a minute, Karen. Thanks, but Mandy. In the meantime, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, tomorrow, we are having Omji on in the afternoon. No, it's not tomorrow. It's Saturday morning. Saturday, I'm losing my marbles, everybody. Saturday morning. Today is Thursday, right? Yeah. Saturday morning with Amji. I think it's at half past 10 and he's doing, I can't remember. 
This is terrible. I can't remember these things anymore. OMG is doing something oh. about the power of discernment. It's a oh. mindfulness talk. So fabulous. And that's at 10.30 on Saturday morning. In other words, everybody, Shabbat Shalom for tomorrow. Have a lovely Friday night and see you Saturday morning. And Audrey, you're very welcome. It was great. Karen, thank you very much. Mariana, nice thank to you. See you smile. You weren't smiling just now. <laughs> Good night, everyone, and thank you. Thanks for coming.